All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Shaz. I'm from PSB Academy's uh, School of Engineering and Technology. So uh, jumping right down to it, we are not going to be talking too much about the school itself. Rather, I'll be jumping straight into an introduction of uh, Edith Cullen University. So if you don't mind, I'll be sharing my screen in a moment. All right. Okay, so if you guys are looking at my screen, uh, we'll be addressing cybersecurity excellence with Edith Cowan University. So firstly, a little bit more about cybersecurity itself. Uh, as you all may know, with increased uh, digitization, cybersecurity is currently a skill that is uh, useful and can be applied to almost any industry. So you look at banking, you look at finance, you look at tourism, entertainment, no matter what industry you name it, uh, almost every single industry that has reliance on digitization, has, uh, can, you can apply cybersecurity to it. So as a result, this has become a skill that is quite highly in demand, not only in Singapore, but also across the world. But of course, in the context of today's session, um, I would like to highlight that the Singapore government has actually uh, mentioned that it will shore up over $1 billion to build up the country's cybersecurity capabilities over the next three years. So with this, we find a lot of people, uh, at, based on our experience as educators, we find a lot of people looking into how, to, how they can upgrade themselves with a cybersecurity skill set, be it in terms of uh, academic or in terms of just uh, on the ground uh, skills. So that's where uh, Edith Cowan University comes in. So a little bit of uh, their credentials, they are top 100 university in Asia Pacific. They are one of the top young universities in the world and also one of the top universities for sustainable impact. But what actually makes Edith Cowan shine is actually its uh, cybersecurity capabilities. So Edith Cowan University is one of only two academic centers of cybersecurity excellence, which is designated by the Australian federal government. So this makes Edith Cowan University the only ACCSE designated university with a cybersecurity program that's being offered right here in Singapore. And this particular degree uh, over in Australia is also accredited by the Australian Computer Society. All right, so if we were to jump into the uh, Master of Cybersecurity Award, the program that's currently being offered over here at PSB Academy, we're offering it uh, full-time and part-time. And it's actually designed for professionals looking to upgrade and diversify their cybersecurity skill set. So you may have qualifications in other areas, uh, may or may not be related to IT. This postgraduate program can actually help you to, to add on to whatever capabilities you may already have and top up whatever skill sets you have with a cybersecurity one to make you a little bit more uh, value added to whatever other career paths you may be looking into. So just a little bit of a side info, our next intake will con uh, commence in October. It's a two-year course and currently we're having a study rebate. So if let's say you guys are more interested in that, you can chat with our consultants later on. All right, so Q&A will address it a little bit later after uh, Patrick's speech. So without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, Dr. Patrick. He's actually the course coordinator for Edith Cowan University's cybersecurity program. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Just going to share my screen. Okay, so thank you for joining me today. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some of the core elements of why cybersecurity is so paramount in today's society. And uh, I'm going to give you an overview of our courses and what we actually have to offer. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am a senior cybersecurity lecturer at ECU, and I've been there approximately 14 years now, and um, I've designed uh, many of the postgraduate cybersecurity courses from the ground up uh, to address the needs of industry um, and international industry experts. And as a result, it is one of the most renowned courses now um, in Australia, and it does uh, speak for itself uh, internationally. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a video for you just to give you a bit of an overview of uh, Edith Cowan University as well as the actual cybersecurity program, whereby our Vice Chancellor uh, will uh, speak a little bit. 
It's one of the great paradoxes of our time, that the very technologies that empower us to do great good can also be used to undermine us and inflict great harm. ACU's been delivering cybersecurity training before it was even recognized as being cybersecurity. And in fact, uh, if you look at our degrees that we offer, they go right back to the early 2000s, I think 2001. We now have well over 2,000 alumni in that space, and that's growing, and it's continuing to grow. The demand is, is huge. ECU is leading the nation in creating the cybersecurity experts of the future, and boy, do we need them. I chose to study at ECU because it's one of only two academic centres of excellence for cyber security, but I also wanted a more hands-on practical approach which helps me transition into a cyber career. At Woodside we have hired a number of ECU students. We've been really impressed with their technical knowledge, their enthusiasm, their willingness to learn. There is a skill shortage across the cyber industry and it's a challenge for Woodside, for industry, universities and government. ECU is addressing this shortfall through our strong engagement with industry and government which benefits both staff and students, making sure that our graduates have the skills that industry needs. Edith Cowan University has the reputation of being the best university in Australia for cyber security graduates. Anyone who's in the cyber security industry knows of Edith Cowan University's world-class reputation and they know of the quality of Edith Cowan University's graduates. I think what ECU does bring to the table is having the years of understanding of how to train professionals in cybersecurity. And so definitely in Western Australia, hands down, ECU graduates have the practical experience above and beyond other universities. The adversary out there is continually evolving. The way they're attacking is getting smarter and smarter. So it's very important for an ECU graduate to be able to come out of uh, their training program and understand what's happening in the industry. We train the cybersecurity experts of the future through our wonderful qualifications that we provide. And we also do incredibly advanced research into the cybersecurity area at our Security Research Institute. And of course, we are the headquarters of the CRC in cybersecurity, which brings together government, industry, and the university sector. We've just opened a brand new education and training facility, which we call the CyberSoc Security Operations Centre. But it's more than just about security operations, it's around investigation, incident response analysis, attack defence scenarios. The SOC here at ECU is unique to the region and it really does cement our place as one of the leading cyber security institutions in the region. Just as we're all connected like never before, we have to work together like never before, both to seize opportunities but also meet the challenges of this information age. So hopefully that you know gave you a bit of an overview and a summarization of uh, just how you know paramount cybersecurity is. And I guess if you took anything away from that, is that uh, it is a challenge which is not going away. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight some of the more uh, prominent you know cybersecurity issues that are at hand. Um, you know, if we just look at the cost of cybersecurity globally, you know, it is exceeding. Uh, $600 billion, and that was in 2018. And that's only gonna go up as we continually move everything into the online domain. Uh, and obviously this is gonna be of great concern because there is a, a, a lot of you know, financial assets now which are stored online and a lot of financial assets which are managed by corporations and subsequently cyber criminals want that money. Um, I guess one of the, you know, the things to note is that, you know, this whole concept of robbing a bank with a gun these days lacks class because there are far more opportunistic mechanisms by which you can achieve the same goal, get more money, and people can do it from their home computer anonymously. And so we need to train those individuals to uh, detect and to stop those types of attacks uh, you know, before they you know, exceed and become you know, more common. You know, if you look at the average cybersecurity uh, incident cost, you know, it's, it's, a pro it's just under $4 million, which again is quite concerning. And a lot of organizations that succumb to a cybersecurity attack don't recover. Uh, a lot of organizations are reactive rather than proactive. And that means they will look at the issues once they've actually occurred rather than focusing on stopping the issues from actually impacting the organization to begin with. And this is something that we train our students to address, to 
and enable them to go to an organization and demonstrate to the organization that they need to uh, utilize these you know, resources, these security techniques now before they become the next victim. So I guess one of the things to look at is, you know, I'm going to show you a few toys and the toys are uh, very reflective of where we are uh, you know, in society at the moment. Because, you know, you often associate toys and kids' toys specifically, uh, you know, with just being a pastime uh, for the kids to enjoy. But, you know, technology and kids' toys have evolved significantly. You know, if we look at these, you know, early logic games from the 1970s, they were quite standalone. They didn't really do anything. And subsequently, m most individuals who, you know, owned or used one of these played with it in a very limited and static capacity. But then if you move you know, forward to modern day kids toys, so, you know, like, such, such as Barbie and all these kind of uh, you know, similar um, uh, you know, kids toys that they adopt, they become internet enabled. A lot of toys now are what we refer to as IOT toys, the internet of thing toys. And this is, extremely concerning because if we get a toy like this, for example, uh, yeah, the, you know, the whole premise behind these by the manufacturer is that the kid can, or the child can ask the toy a question and subsequently the, the, the toy communicates with a server over the internet and Googles the question and finds a response and subsequently the toy uh, speaks back to the student. But what they didn't realize is that same little toy can be exploited whereby it can listen into conversations. Uh, and in many situations, uh, it was discovered that these toys would actually respond incorrectly. And instead they would actually say things to the kids, which was somewhat um, inappropriate. You know, Hello Barbie, you know, is, is another common example. You know, Barbie doll is, is synonymous with, you know, many kids growing up these days. And yet this is another example whereby if we take these Barbie dolls apart now, they're not just a, you know, a, a plastic based toy anymore. They encompass circuitry. They encompass you know, memory, cameras, power connectors, microphones, they're communicating with the internet. Now, what this means essentially now is that these toys are filled with vulnerabilities. And a lot of the time people associate, you know, kids or, you know, so cybersecurity incidents with corporations. Over the last few years, that's kind of transcended towards, uh, you know, home users as well. And now it's it's kids that are being targeted, and you know, trying to find a toy for kids these days that doesn't connect to the internet is quite rare. You know, all all toys want to connect to the internet. Even if, if you look at you know, uh, gaming consoles, you know, Playstations and Xbox, they all need to connect to the internet, and they all have. Uh, you know, microphones embedded in them that enable a person to communicate, but you don't know what's happening behind the scenes and whether uh, those conversations are being recorded, whether things that are occurring in the room are actually being recorded by a cyber criminal and how that could potentially be misused. Now, I was going to give you a very simple example. Imagine if your child does have one of these, you know, Hello Barbie dolls, and while the child's playing with it, the parents, for example, let's, let's just say they're discussing their financial matters. You know, let's say they're doing their, their banking online. Let's say they're you know, talking about their credit card expenses or where they plan to go and so forth. That, that data is being collected. That's, that's forming intelligence, which cyber criminals can then exploit. You know, it is a concerning progression in technology, but it's not just kids' toys. You know, think about what people now have in their homes. CCTV cameras, web cameras, home routers, you know, all these things have the capacity to record and to store information about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. All of these devices can be exploited. And by exploited, I mean that there is a weakness in these devices, which the manufacturers don't know about yet because they're focusing on evolving these products. But cyber criminals, on the other hand, love leveraging these existing products and finding a weakness. And finding a weakness 
that they can leverage to get inside your homes, get inside a business. These problems are not going to diminish. So essentially, Hello Barbie is a new type of army now. Yeah, these are at the forefront now of uh, you know, attacking your home network, of capturing data. They look so innocent, but they are plagued with security issues that most people don't concern themselves with. This is why we need cybersecurity professionals, not just in Australia, but worldwide. Because these toys, these products, which we have you know, learned to use each and every day, are being adopted by everyone, everywhere, all around the world. Um, you know, think about what other devices you have in your home environment. You know, these days, fridges are now connected to the internet. And as a result, your fridge could actually be sending spam email to other people because the fridge gets compromised and subsequently it starts attacking other devices. And it's somewhat comical, but you know, more and more devices are being connected to the internet. Fridges, washing machines, television. All you have to do now is go to your local shop and just see how many of those devices now have internet capability. As we progress with technology, more and more devices are becoming internet enabled. More devices can be compromised. And it's these cyber criminals which are subsequently capturing these devices and leveraging their weaknesses to attack you, the consumer, to attack businesses. Because your financial data is worth money. Your confidential information is worth money. By potentially putting one of those devices offline and sending you a text message, for example, with a ransom that says, you must pay this money or your fridge will no longer work or your air conditioner will no longer work. You know, these, these are simple little tactics which consumers are falling victim to. Because if you think about it, you know, on a very simple um, playing field, if your fridge was compromised and someone threatened to break it, you know, your fridge is worth money and then if the fridge breaks down, your food might go off. It's, a, it's an additional expense whereby you would more than likely want to pay that small ransom to stop that threat from actually occurring. All these devices, you know, fish tanks, you know, hack the thermostat, you know, and leverage that to steal high roller gamblers databases. You know, the two often aren't interconnected, but it's because these IoT devices are being placed in various areas now. So in this instance, a casino, because you know, the fish tank does look appealing, attractive in a casino, but people don't realize, well, if that fish tank is somehow connected to the internet, that device or that fish tank can be exploited to capture data from the surrounding um, environment. So if we look at what else is vulnerable, you know, insulin pumps, as an example. You know, life-saving equipment now communicates with the internet. A lot of uh, patient medical devices capture data from the patient send this over the internet so that the doctor, the medical doctor, can subsequently monitor the results and rectify the, uh, the, the, the quantity of dosage based on the patient. Now, what if someone was to hack into the, one of these pumps, for example, and overdose a patient with an excessive quantity of medication? I mean, I don't have to kind of go any deeper to make you realize what the potential consequences could actually be. Uh, you know, th there was an incident where former US Vice President Dick Cheney disabled his pacemaker's wireless capability to prevent possible assassination attempts. This is, you know, quite significant. And it's, it's a real threat. Now, just imagine how many individuals could potentially be targeted who have wireless pacemakers and could potentially be held ransom. You know, pay this money within 24 hours or we will 
leverage your pacemaker to essentially end your life. You know, this is an ongoing threat. So more and more medical devices are being attacked. All these medical devices in hospitals, in home environments, in GPs, they're all internet and network capable. And as a result, cyber criminals are realizing perfect opportunity to attack these devices, to break them, to hack into them, because they store data. That data is worth money. They can also be used to attack a patient, to attack a hospital, to hold an individual ransom so they can extract money. So is there really demand for cybersecurity professionals? Of course there is. The skills gap is not shrinking. There are not enough people to fill the jobs. All you have to do is look at you know, the average uh, you know, pay these days for a cyber analyst, you know, $75,000 US on average. A chief information security officer, about $200,000 US on average these days. The number of jobs is increasing because more and more businesses are moving online. More and more services are moving online. You know, the current situation that's been happening around the world has just shown how the demand for online services is required. You know, essentially, the worldwide uh, you know, population moved online to conduct and to engage in their day-to-day -day tasks. You search for a job on uh, you know, news advert websites, and you know, there's, there's thousands of jobs at any point in time. And all you have to do is, you know, in this example here, is look how many jobs exist you know, with an $80,000 plus salary, or $100,000 plus, $120,000. I mean, organizations are paying good money because they realize that they need quality individuals to address the growing cybersecurity incidents that are occurring around the world. So our Master of Cybersecurity course, as you've already uh, you know, been exposed to, is one of the best, if not the best. We had cybersecurity before it was a thing. I remember back in the early 2000s, we already had computer security, information security units. No one was even talking about this because we saw what was going on into the future. So we've been able to uh, leverage our understanding of what industry and employers want. We've been able to upgrade and evolve our courses to meet the demand of industry and the expertise of what industry actually wants. So our courses cover a very broad range of areas, specifically based on what industry has told us they want for people to be employable. And as was said previously, you know, our course is accredited by the Australian Computer Society. We work together with many different organizations. And ECU is one of two universities in Australia that was awarded um, funding to evolve and to be a leader in cybersecurity for research and teaching in Australia. So you know, this is a huge thing because you know, there, there are many universities in Australia, but to be one of two is you know, an, an incredible outcome. So I'll just talk you know, very briefly about our course structure. So this is the course structure that I've um, developed. And this is the course structure which I developed after consulting industry and asking them, what do you want? What will you need in five, 10 years? What units are no longer applicable? And what units will help our students become employable as soon as they finish? In many instances, students undertaking our program get jobs before they even fit, you know, finish the course. One, because we give them practical, authentic skills that they can translate into industry. Secondly, we have a reputation. Other universities are playing catch up. We know what industry wants. That's why they work so closely with us. So in our first you know, semester of study, students typically do a, a basic cybersecurity unit coupled with um, networking and then network security. And this gives students the fundamental knowledge to move forward and subsequently move on to units like scripting languages. And the two really popular units, ethical hacking. We, can, we get taught how to hack into all different types of systems. 
as well as digital forensics, where you get to perform authentic forensic investigations, just like you see on TV, just like you see the police force doing around the world. And this enables you to extract data from phones, computers, all other IoT devices, and solve crimes, solve those puzzles. And then as students progress, they do project management units, data analysis, examining data, understanding what it means, finding patterns. And then lastly, information warfare, because information has become so powerful in today's society. And then the final unit is a significant project unit, where you bring everything together and working in conjunction with a supervisor, you apply that industry knowledge to solve a real world uh, problem. And that's the completion of uh, that course. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that's given you a, a very broad overview of our course. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that have come through. Or if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to um, answer anything. Yeah, Ryan Shasi again from BSB. Uh, there was one question from uh, Asha H, who, uh, who, who asked uh, whether, whether ECU will accept credits from similar cybersecurity courses done at local universities in Singapore. So uh, based on this, I would assume that the best uh, course of action would be for Asha to submit his or her requirements, uh, qualifications, sorry, to us so that we may, we may get ECU to take a look and see whether it is possible. Would that be correct, Patrick? Exactly, yes. And so all applications come through me. Uh, I review all the applications. Uh, and one of the things I will always say is make sure all the documentation is there. Uh, because a lot of the times I do get, you know, situations whereby someone wants to get credit and there's not enough documentation and I have to request more. Um, and then we kind of go back and forth. So, you know, essentially what you're trying to do is convince me that the credit that or the unit that you're trying to get credit for does align to one of the units within the course. Any other questions that have emerged? I believe a question has come through. Uh... Yeah, currently there. Okay, I have a question from Daniel. Okay, Daniel, let me help you answer this question. Currently, the course fees, I believe I've shown in the previous slide, the total course fee will be $32,000, but currently we have some rebates available. So to find out whether you're eligible or not, of course, the same thing best course of action would be to get in touch with our consultants and they'll be able to assist you to see whether you can get any additional rebates or not. Okay, another question from Asha. I think I'll have to direct this to Jamie. Jamie, I think uh, Asha is asking whether this uh, slide deck will be available. Will we be able to... Um, I mean, if it's okay with your side, we can take down his email. So, Asha, would you drop your email in your Q&A and then I'll get uh, Shaz to send you the site deck on the pricing. Okay, Asha. All right. Thanks, Jamie. No worries. Okay. It would seem that we have no more questions. If anyone has any other questions, like even at a later point in time, I'm more than happy to uh, answer anything. Uh, oh, there's some questions coming through. Uh, uh, so I can answer Alan Wong's question directly. Uh, basically, entry requirements are based on an existing bachelor degree or uh, relevant work experience. Uh, so when applying, as long as you demonstrate that you have a relevant work experience, uh, kind of in IT, cybersecurity beforehand, 
um, of at least five years, then that usually is sufficient um, admittance for uh, entering into the course. Yeah, any more questions, guys? We've got one question from Elvin Lim. Uh, what is the minimum requirement? No, I think that was related to what uh, Patrick has answered previously. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was a similar question. Yeah. Uh, there's a question that's come through. Uh, class will take place during circuit breaker. Okay, let me answer this. Uh, Asha, currently during the circuit breaker period, all of our classes are being conducted online. So uh, lessons are being recorded, assessments are being done online. So for all of the courses at PSB Academy, it's possible to continue with your classes without having to uh, go to the campus during the circuit breaker period. But of course, once we are allowed to open, then you will have full access to our facilities like our computer labs and such. Uh, so Alvin, uh, yes, uh, basically uh, a, a bachelor's degree um, equivalent is uh, a suitable for entry requirements. Uh, and then Asha, to, to answer your question about the, the practicality um, of classes, uh, the, the, the practical element, I'm assuming is what you mean. Uh, basically, uh, all given IT, uh, basically all assessments, tasks, unit content has uh, hands-on practical elements in a virtualized environment. Uh, it's somewhat you know, difficult to kind of communicate that now, but basically our, uh, our units, everything is done in a virtualized environment. So it, it's, it does make more sense once you're in it, but yeah, because you, you know, if you think about it, you don't actually need to be in front of a computer to be able to you know, complete tasks and you know, to do a, a, a hacking scenario or to do a digital forensic investigation. As long as you've got access to a computer, everything else uh, becomes very, very clear. All right, just to add on to uh, Alvin's uh, question, uh, and this applies to uh, all other questions pertaining to, to your current qualifications and whether we can get into the course. The best way to do this is for us to take a look at your documents. So uh, if you can see uh, my link on my, on, on my slide, you can chat with our consultants there. You can submit all the uh, soft copy uh, of your documents over there. And we can take a look and help to determine whether you can immediately enter the course or not. Okay, uh, one last question from uh, Alan Wong here. Uh, are there any internship opportunities? So currently the course is being offered full-time and part-time. For part-time courses, usually students are already currently working. So I think for those uh, internships are definitely out of the question. For the full-time courses, uh, there may not be any uh, internships per se, but we do have a lot of uh, opportunities within the school where we work with our industry partners on projects and things like that. So again, uh, this is something that uh, our consultants and lecturers will be very happy to share with you. So if you can get in touch with us, we can share with you more details on how this works. All right, so as I don't see any more questions, I think I'll hand the screen over back to Jamie. Jamie, over to you.